as we welcome in our buddy Matt George, host of the Locked On Kings podcast and of ABC 10. Matt, so many things uh, we want to talk about here. Let's just bring you into a conversation we were having uh, just moments ago about Davion Mitchell. Uh, anything stand out to you about his preseason? His shooting and offense has not been what I was hoping for. I think we're all we're hoping for a carryover from how he ended last season, but I'm also not surprised by it considering he played 40 minutes a game and De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Abonis, and, and everybody else with, except for Harrison Barnes was out uh, basically. So offensively, I've been a di- bit disappointed, but I haven't really lingered on it because I've been really pleased with how the Mike Brown system has remained consistent throughout the entire game, regardless of who's running the point, even when Matthew Delvadova is out there. So I I, I like how Malik Monk and, and, um, and Davion Mitchell, when they've come into the game and Fox and Herter have gone, gone out. I mean, you, you notice that it's not Fox and Herter on the floor, but they're trying to play the same way. Mitchell's still trying to push the tempo. I thought he's run really well picking uh, in the pick and roll with DeMontis Sabonis. I think the best pick and roll connection so far this preseason And I'm not just talking about Sabonis' monster dunk, but the best pick and roll combinations have been between the two of them. Now, Fox and Sabonis have had some good ones as well, including the oop that Fox threw to Sabonis that way more people would be talking about had Sabonis not had his dunk uh, in that Portland game. So I wouldn't say I'm disappointed necessarily by by Davion in preseason. I, I probably wanted to see a bit more, but from my backup point guard to be able to come in and continue to run the offense the same way, I'm I'm pleased with that. Matt, do you think he's been affected um, by the inconsistent nature of the of the rotations and who comes in? And and by no fault, it's not a knock on Mike Brown, but it's preseason. His first year, he's trying to um, integrate some new guys and integrate some things and trying to see what works. Because of that, Davion maybe doesn't get the same guys that he's playing with all the time or the same um, – time stamps when he comes in the game, all that stuff. Do you think that has contributed to maybe the inconsistent nature of his play um, this preseason? Possibly, but I wouldn't necessarily use that as an excuse because for the most part, he's played with that same five bench unit with the exception of this Phoenix game. The Phoenix game got a little out of control because of Rashawn and, and, and Keegan being out. And those are two of the five of that second unit that he spent a lot of time playing with in practice. It was himself, uh, Trey Lyles and Malik Monk with the two of them. And we saw them a lot together in game one in LA. We saw them a decent amount together in Portland. And I think because the Portland game was a blowout, Mike Brown went deeper into his rotation than he intended to had the, that game been closer. I think we would have seen even more of Fox and Sabonis, even more of Davion and Monk and, and maybe even Kevin Herter. So I, I, I can see how that could have some sort of effect and that's something that i hope is is completely ironed out come opening night and i have no idea if we're going to see in this lakers game as close to a a true to form rotation as possible or if it's like an nfl week and and the starters barely play at all um so we'll have to wait and see what mike's philosophy is with that but i i don't think davion would use that as an excuse and and i haven't necessarily seen that enough to think that the irregularities are affecting him what do you think uh is mike's direction with Casey Akpala in in this situation with the starting four, which I know is very near and dear to your heart. <laughs> yeah, this uh, this has been uh, an opinion that I had that has made me a little bit unpopular this week, and it kind of surprised me after That's the hard to believe after the Portland. Ga- okay, <laughs> the consolation prize after the, <laughs> after the um, <laughs> after the uh, the Portland game. The only real negative that I had, other than the free throw shooting in that game, was was and the defending without fouling was that like I, I thought it was time to kind of end that Casey Paula starting experiment. Um, I personally don't think, well, I, well, Casey has been good, and, and I'm actually going to start with this because I think it's important to point this out. I personally, and I think a lot of us went from going into training camp, is Casey Paula going to make the roster? If he does, is he going to be like a, a third or fourth wing to, oh no, this guy should probably be in the rotation nightly because of what he provides defensively and, the, and how versatile he is defensively. So that mm-hmm. speaks volumes to me. Um, also we didn't know too much about the guy. Now we've seen a little bit more of his sample size. That being said, I think Keegan Murray is far more effective period than Casey Akpala is. Uh, Casey's a better defender than, than Keegan is, but in my opinion, it would be better. And it, the Kings would have more, it would be better for the Sacramento Kings overall, more effective for the Sacramento Kings overall. I think to have Keegan as part of that starting lineup to punch first, rather than have Casey Akpala in the starting lineup to 
block first. I know he did a good job against Damian Lillard to some extent. He did a good job against um, LeBron James to some extent. Both of them had bad nights. It's not just because of KZ, but regardless, he he did his job. But to me, I just think it, the Kings would be better off with opening a game with someone who compliments them offensively, who is not a colossal drop off defensively here. Like uh, Keegan Murray is not a Casey Okpala defender, but Keegan Murray is also not going to be terrible defensively, at least in my opinion. And from what we've seen. So to me, regardless of how many minutes Keegan and Casey are playing, because Keegan's obviously been playing way more. I would like to see Keegan starting. I don't know if Keegan would have started in this Phoenix game had he been available. Um, I also didn't read too far into Casey not playing at all. And I think Mike Brown addressed that today saying uh, that he just wanted to get another look at, uh, at, at other guys. But I think Casey absolutely should be a part of the rotation. Man, I kind of, I don't strongly disagree, but I kind of disagree. I've been a big fan of what Casey's done. Um, in his time as, as a starter. It's only been two preseason games. I understand that. But I see the vision, and I see what he could possibly add to the starting unit with what he does on a defensive end. And we all know at some point Keegan Murray is going to be the starter. Um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to hold off on that for as long as possible. I'd like to start the season and see what KZ in the starting lineup looks like, especially like when you talk about um, Keegan's still going to play the majority of the minutes. Hell, he might even be in the closing lineup over KZ, depending on what's going on. So he's going to get those opportunities. But I've been a big fan of the defensive versatility that you get with KZ Akpala in the starting lineup. Yeah, and I see that. I understand that argument. And that's the argument that I've, I've seen the most of. And to be honest, KZ has done his job, with the exception of KZ hasn't hit a shot. And the reality is if he is going to be out there now, if Mike Brown wants to play him the first five, six minutes of the game and then not play him until the second half, if he wants to do that, like he did in that Portland game, I mean, okay, except you're not just going to be facing the starters for a handful of minutes. And then the the second and third unit of guys who are trying to, to carve out spots on this roster. If you're facing the Los Angeles Lakers in a regular season game, you're facing 35 plus minutes of LeBron and AD, assuming AD can stay healthy. If you're when you're facing the Blazers, Dame's going to play damn near that entire game, probably because he has to if the Blazers want any chance to win. Like, so to me, it, what the deficiency on the offensive end I think is going to become a problem, and the reason why it hasn't looked like as much of a problem yet is because the sample size hasn't been big enough. Again, if if KZ, if you want to have him like an opener in baseball and have mm-hmm. KZ come in defensively, play the first five six minutes set the tone defensively and then sit him down until later on in the game. I mean, okay, you can do that and hopefully that works, but if you're going to keep KZ in for long enough stretches to have the defensive impact, I think Mike Brown is truly hoping for, I think you're going to have a significant drop off or spacing spacing issue offensively because the only thing KZ hasn't shown me to this point is the ability to hit that, hit that outside shot defensively though. I love what I've seen. But Matt, is there something to be said for, Keegan's offensive impact with the second unit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. 100%. Uh, I, I think Keegan has done a phenomenal job coming off the bench and helping that bench. I think he's made up for in some ways. I'm not saying Malik Monk has been disappointing, but Malik hasn't been that impact yeah, off the bench yeah. offensively mm-hmm. that I expected. And like even Terrence Davis has looked like more of an impactful player in, in limited minutes offensively than Malik has at times. Malik had a stretch in the Portland game where he hit back to back threes. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And then it was in the second qu- or third quarter. And then Terrence Davis hit a couple threes and then Tr- Trey Lyles hit a couple threes. So Malik almost had his thunder stolen a little bit by a team push instead of a Malik Monk push. Mm-hmm. But Keegan has been Mr. Consistent offensively with that second unit uh, throughout the preseason from what we've seen. And and it goes back to everything we've seen over summer and and during the California Classic. But to me, that's just it. I think Keegan can do that with anybody he's on the floor with. So I don't think there's a concern. Maybe there's a concern with the offense of the second unit putting Keegan in the in the first unit, but if that's the case, then stagger the minutes a little bit. Keegan can be the first one off the floor if you want to move Harris into the four or do whatever to get Davion Mitchell into the game or whoever the sixth man is for this team off the bench immediately. Take Keegan out at that point, have him close the first quarter and, and start the second quarter if that's what you want with the second unit. That's exactly what we saw Mike Brown do with uh, DeMontis Sabonis in the Portland game. When Fox came out of the game, Sabonis came back in. Sabonis actually took over the scoring load. So I think I don't think taking Murray out of the second unit and starting him means that 
you can't still use his offensive consistency and productivity with that bench unit if they need that offense, if they're struggling offensively. Hmm. I hear you. I hear you. And like I said, it, it's it's uh, it's going to happen anyway. Keegan's too good. I think he's going to happen. Although I heard a lot of people, somebody in the chat brought it up, and they said Keegan is going to be Tyler Hero. And I didn't even think about it. Like Tyler Hero is one of the best players on the Heat. I think he averaged almost 20 points a game last year. Six man, he came off the bench. So that would be crazy. I got a scenario for that you. That means the man. kings of the heat then. I'll Let's take go. it. Let's go. I'll take it. I got I got a scenario for you, Matt. Monty Riles. <laughs> LeBron knew him and, and Monty. Monty was going to be Monty <laughs> Riley. He knew. Um, I got a scenario for you. KZ starts 25 games in. Kings are 14 and 11. Let's make it 13 and 12. I think that has a different feel to it. 13 and 12. Are you are you clamoring for Keegan to start? Boy, <laughs> there's so many holes in context that I need to know to make that decision. Are they everybody's are they playing right. fine? It's tough. Everybody's That's playing right. fine. Keegan's averaging like 15 a night. KZ is not doing his offensive thing, but he's it, it looks like the Portland game essentially. Where are the, what are the Kings at defensively? Are they middle of the pack? Are they top it looks 10? Just like the Portland game. Whatever you thought about the Portland game and how they, they play defense that game. That's what they've been They're doing. They're right the smack dab in the middle. 15th. Boy, I, I still think I start Keegan. I still think so. Really? But yeah, I, I think at that point, like, I, You're I just. winning, though. Yeah, I, I understand. Maybe like it's the ain't broke, don't fix it approach. I, 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 it, my brain has a hard time believing that the Kings are in that position because KZ Akpala is a starter. But let's mm. put it this way I, regardless of my feelings on the situation, I trust Mike Brown way more than I trust myself. So if Mike Brown rolls Casey Akpala out in the starting lineup on opening night, it's not what I would do, but I'm okay with it. I trust it because I trust Mike Brown. And, and Mike Brown has has told me that this guy has defensive player of the year potential. Mm. I have seen elements of that. I have seen someone who has come in and immediately inserted themselves as not just one of the best defenders on the team, but a guy who's not afraid to back down from any challenge in guarding LeBron and guarding Dame and doing a pretty good job. So... If Mike Brown trusts it, if that's who Mike Brown goes with, I trust him 100%. It's not the call that I would make as the head coach, but it's a good thing I'm not an NBA head coach because I'd probably be worse than most of the head coaches we've seen here in Sacramento. That's hard to believe. If if it was <laughs> if, if 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 the Kings were 13 to 12 and you, you said it's hard, it, it would be hard to believe that's because of KZ Akpala or KZ Akpala's defense. No, it might it, it it might not be, but it might be what KZ KZ is adding to to the start of the game. But it also might be what Keegan is doing when he comes into the game, because sure. no matter no matter the situation with with KZ Akpala as as a starter or otherwise, Keegan Murray's going to play more minutes, and in all likelihood, Keegan Murray's going to play significantly more minutes than KZ Akpala is. I don't I don't know that I fully grasp the strategy of of starting a guy the first four or five minutes of, of each half. And then I assume you sprinkle him in like, and he winds up being like a 22 minute per night guy. I don't know that I fully grasp the concept of that, especially when you got a LeBron James, just as an example, who's going to play 38. Yeah. All right. Well, what are you doing the other 16 minutes that LeBron James is in the game? Right. So again, like, like you said, this is Mike Brown's job. He's obviously very good at it. But I think there's so many different things to weigh outside of what KZ contributes as the starter and into what Keegan Murray contributes with that second unit. If Mike Brown believes that KZ Akpala starting is helping set the tone defensively for the rest of his team, and we're seeing results to that, we're seeing the Kings team defense responding or playing up to the level that KZ and Davion Mitchell are trying to play on the defensive end of the floor, then he's all the more valuable right there. So and kudos uh, to Casey Akpala if that's the case. Right. Absolutely. Casey Akpala is setting the tone, man. That's that's something. And, and it's not just that, too. It's like in the case of if KZ can guard the best guards in the league, like does that take a little bit off of De'Aaron Fox out of the Absolutely. game? Like, like that's a that's yeah. a big question, too. So, like, I see the value of him. Again, I am concerned about playing stretch minutes of KZ Akpala offensively with this group because at that point you have, you're putting a ton on the shoulders of Herter and Harrison Barnes to make shots and even De'Aaron and DeMontis Sabonis to some extent. I just, I think KZ has a ways to go to earn the respect of defenders to 
may be impactful on the perimeter on the offensive end of the ball. But if you're not making any shots, but you're not giving up any shots, if you're starting a game and maybe it's after the first 10 minutes, the score is only 10 to six, but LeBron is one of seven. Okay. I see the value in that too. So I, I like the idea of the Kings not getting punched in the mouth and the victims of an 8-0 run to start a game. But I also think it would also be nice to see the Kings get off to an 8-0 run to start the game, which I think Keegan helps with. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I feel Harrison, you you brought up a good point. Uh, you're putting a lot of pressure on on Harrison and, and Herter to make shots. They should make shots. They should make shots. You know, and I know they're a better offensive team probably with Keegan instead of Casey Akpala. But you got enough offensive players. I know floor spreading and, and all this other stuff. But you got a 20-point-per-game score in De'Aaron Fox. 20 point per game in Sabonis. Herter's a, a 13 to 15 point guy. Harrison Barnes is a 15 to 7. You got enough. Casey Akpala being out there shouldn't destroy your offense, in my opinion. Well, and also low key, I, I think Keegan Murray might end up being the best three point shooter on this Kings team. Like if he continues what right. he's doing, yeah. he might end up being the best three point shooter on this team to where, again, I, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for Mike Brown to keep Keegan Murray out of the starting lineup for a long period of time. Let's just put it that way. So I I, I'm ready to give him the keys right now. Of course, that might be premature. Totally understand if it's premature. If you want to ease a rookie into it, Mike Brown, you know way better than I do. But like, if you're looking for three-point shooting to really open up the game for Fox and Sabonis, like Keegan Murray, I think is going to be the three-point shooter. The defenses know they absolutely cannot leave. And if they mm -hmm. do, they're going to be punished. That Even having that one guy, I think, is a massive difference than having a guy in Casey Paula who the defense will gamble on leaving every single time because they know probably 70% of the time it's it's a good gamble. Yeah. I yeah. I, I don't think this is about Keegan being a rookie, though. I, I I think this is a legitimate strategy. I do too. I do Brown's too. Part. I don't think it has to do like I know Dave Yeager and and coaches in the past have felt certain ways about rookies starting, and then we went through what we went through with Tyrese Halliburton, the greatest point guard that the league has ever seen, and and him not being a starter, uh, uh his first year. So, I, I I know that that seeps into everybody's head. I think there's a different reason for this, um, and I I do think it's the defensive stuff. Um, and I do, I also think you're right, Matt I don't, and Kenny, I don't think it's going to last long. Um, and then I don't know what happens to Casey Akpala after that. Mm. Like, what does, he, does he fall into the rotation or does he just fall? I, I don't know what you do with KZ if he's, if he's not the starter. I um, think he should be a rotational guy to where if like, if Keegan replaces him in the starting lineup and the Kings are off to a slow start defensively, KZ might be the first guy off the bench. KZ and Damian, uh, Davion come into the game and set the tone for us a little bit. Like, I think there are valuable minutes there, even if it's 15, 20 minutes a night of. And and, and at that point, too, like, I can live a little bit with KZ's offensive drop-off because at that point I'm expecting more from Malik, more from Davion, more from other guys in that second unit to to figure it out offensively and 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 get them through. Plus, like, I think there's a spot for KZ Akpala at times in a closing lineup if you're having a lead and trying to secure it. Like, so I think there's valuable minutes still there for KZ. It's not as defined as the first five minutes of the game or six minutes of the, of the game as a starter. But I definitely think there's a role for KZ Akpala consistently nightly on this Kings team. Were you upset with what you saw last night? Um, yes. We don't know in general, like, yeah, it was a mess. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, were the, you upset that you had to stream the game on a computer uh, or a absolutely, laptop? Or absolutely. A tablet? Ah, oh, it's frustrating. But uh, do, do you look at that as the Kings doing the same old things they did in the past where there were so many guys out for Phoenix and they didn't show up again to start the game? Do you think that legitimately was, oh, here they go doing that again? Or I kind of lead towards the side of, like, I get it. It was the preseason. Nobody was playing. There was probably a lot of guys in the back of their mind mentally but like, what do we even, let's just get out of here. Like, it doesn't really matter. I think there was always going to be an element of, uh-oh, in, in this game coming off of the shooting performance that Sacramento had against Portland. Like, it's really hard to follow. I think the Kings had a game against Charlotte early last season. It might have been Charlotte, where they just went supernova from three-point range. I think they scored 130, 140 points in a, in a win at home. And then the very next game, it was like, yep. Th I mean, they used all their shots for two games in one night. Um, so some, that just seems to happen. So there was an element of me that was expecting it, but yeah, I definitely had, had 
deja vu flashbacks, painful memories to the Kings playing a team that's missing their best entire starting lineup and still somehow finding a way to lose that game. Kings were very good at that last season. And, and what that says to me is this team still has bad habits. They need to break like they're when the majority of your roster that is returning are marquee players, big name players that are going to play heavy minutes. There are going to be bad habits. Plus the bad habits of 15, 16 years of losing for this organization alone that are going to be tough to break at times, which is where I, I really think the real challenge is for Mike Brown is, is breaking those bad habits and, and having the accountability and that togetherness that we've heard preached so much, having that stay true when you're going through those dull moments. Um, but all things considered, like it was a breath of fresh air in both the Laker game and the Phoenix Suns game to see the Kings be absolutely useless on the offensive end of the floor and not get blown out or fall way behind. Like, remember, the the Lakers got off to a 12 to three start. Kevin Herter was the only one who hit a shot at that point. Mike Brown called his timeout. Lakers were five of seven from the field at that point. They went two of 10 over their next 10 shots. So mm. even if offensively Sacramento didn't really close the gap more than a few points during that time, defensively they did enough to where the the, the Lakers only played their, their stars in the first half. LeBron played 16, 17 minutes. AD played 16, 17 minutes. Same thing with Russ. They only led by five at halftime, and we would overall call that a bad offensive half for Sacramento. Second half with the Kings' second unit in and the Lakers' second unit being that, that's where that game got out of hand. So that speaks volumes to me. The fact that, yes, you're taking on the second and third units of the, the and fourth units of the Phoenix Suns in this game. Still defensively, you did enough to carry yourself through the storm of a lid being on the basket. And then I think the biggest gripe that I had, or the biggest request that I had out of last night's game that we saw at the end of the first half, but I wanted to see more of is in games like that, when offensively the team is struggling and especially against competition that you know you're better than those are games where I need to see De'Aaron Fox or DeMontis Sabonis, but mainly De'Aaron Fox say, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm taking over. And Fox, I think scored eight points in like that big run that the Kings had towards the end of the first half to make it a little more respectable at halftime. And that ended up changing a lot of the game. So I saw it in that stretch, but I want to see De'Aaron Fox going, what is happening after that first quarter going, what is like, I'm the best player on this floor. Nobody can stop me. My team is struggling. All right, fine. I'm going to take over. Like that is the star power that I think this Kings team is still missing. That get on my back. I will take you there, guy. And last night I felt like it was an opportunity to see that. We didn't, except for the small stretch. I'm not freaking out about it. But that's like, if I'm really trying to find a gripe, that was mine. We saw uh, Quinn Cook and Kent Bazemore. Uh, get waived today, which leaves uh, one more cut to be made. Who are you? Who do you think that cut goes to? I think it's I, I think it's between Sam Merrill and Matthew Delabadova. I think there's a very real chance that Delhi mm. is down too, um, and the Kings uh, run when they need a third point guard. The Kings go with um, a maybe Kevin Herter or maybe even Malik Monk in certain sets. And we've so, seen so that you a think, little bit. You think your fashion inspiration is, is, I hope is he does. I, yeah, I, I, hope, I hope so too. I, I just, hope he does. I like what he brings. I think he brings energy. I think he brings confidence. He carries himself as someone who can work hard and someone who can be valuable. Like I think about over the course of a season, who could help the Kings more in spot minutes or in, in case of emergency to me, Chima Maneke helps more than, Matthew Delavadova does. I think Sam Merrill might help more than Matthew Delavadova does too because of Sam Merrill's shooting. Um, and I, I also think it's telling, guys, that the first two cuts that the Kings made were two veteran players. Like mm -hmm. that that speaks volumes to me. That means two things. One, the young guys are, are doing well. And I've heard Sam Merrill has had a really good training camp. And mm -hmm. number two, that also says the Kings want longer looks at some of these young guys. Like, And that's where I think Chima Maneke fits into things. I thought he was impressive in his limited minutes last night, I thought he fought hard, played hard, and you can always use that effort over the course of a season. Um, I don't know wh where Chima Maneke gets into the game, but I think the Kings need more depth at around his position than they do at that point guard spot because of the all their capable ball handlers on this roster. And look, in, their, in the event, knock on wood, that Fox or Mitchell go down and you need someone to play 10 to maximum 15 minutes of a point guard spot. That's something that I think if you want to split Munker Herder between those or give it to one of the two of them, I think they can handle it. So if it were me personally, it might be 
Matthew Della Vadova that's getting the cut. Although I also see the value of Matthew Della Vadova as a locker room leader, as an extension of Mike Brown, as a veteran uh, who knows defensive intensity and can really help the team with that defensive accountability. So I'm okay with either a cut of Merrill or Della Vadova. Yeah, I um that's interesting, Matt. Uh, because I didn't I didn't think about Delhi being cut. I can understand it. I see what you're saying. It makes perfect sense. Um, I've actually surprisingly I kind of like Delhi in the in the two games that we've seen him or you know, the time that we've seen him. And like Damian likes to say, that's we're seeing a fraction of what these guys, you know, see on a on a regular basis in in, in practice. But he's actually looked better than I thought. So may, maybe the expectations were like super low to begin with. That's why I'm like, oh, he's not as bad as I thought. But I thought he's I thought he's done all right in his time. And um, I can see, I can envision a place for him on this roster. I think if you're setting odds, Merrill is the more, most likely to get cut. Um, I just I just put the two of them ahead of Shima Maneke at this point. That might be wishful thinking on my part, but from from what I understand, I like Maneke too. I, I think he's. And from what I understand, the Kings do too. Um, and and I think it's telling that Mike Brown has has stuck with or so far in training camp. Got now Quinn Cook had a relationship with Mike Brown in, in the past, so that's kind of the outlier here. But Mike Brown is kind of stuck with these guys that he had this, this relationship with and knows what they can bring from the Nigerian national team. So uh, I, I'm I'm reading that trend and I'm continuing with that trend. Matt George locked on Kings. He had a lot of spicy takes on a. <laughs> Uh, recent edition of of Locked On Kings with our with our guys Chris and Frankie. Uh, it, what 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 do you think was your 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 spiciest? So we did uh, last year. We did a mild, hot, and spicy um, take podcast. Locked On Kings, Return of the Roar, coming together, and uh, I ended up using pretty much every Everybody. take from that into a into <laughs> petty uh, into a, a compilation uh, 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 of all the horrible Which takes. Which was I brilliant. Had. It was yeah, fantastic. It was, that a, was fantastic. So I'm hoping this year will be a little bit different. My spiciest take that I came up with, and it became a good conversation starter, and I, I'll throw this to you guys too, is what has to happen for the Kings to make this happen? Mike Brown winning coach of the year. <laughs> like, what hap- What has to happen? Is it, is it Kings? It, playing isn't enough. So it's the Kings actually locking down like a playoff top six seed. And is it like, to me, it's defensively turning the Kings around into maybe a top 10 defense, which is like astronomical to believe at this point. So, but I thought that was a fun conversation starter of if Mike Brown were to win coach of the year, because he's already the coach of the year in that, that practice facility to everybody who's, who's playing underneath them. What has to happen in Sacramento for that to happen? Yeah, We don't have to dig too deep into the weeds with where they're at defensively and all this other stuff. You said it right, Matt. If they're, bad. if they're, <laughs> <laughs> if they're, if they're in the, uh, in, in the six seed or higher, um, six seed at the very least, he's winning the, the, the coach of the year. And I made this argument yesterday to Damien. I said, the Kings for all the wrong reasons, probably I understand that, but they're one of the more relevant teams in the NBA. And everybody knows their story. You know, they know it because they make jokes about them. I understand that. <laughs> but because of that, and 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 Damien used the example of uh, Chris Finch, who, hey, he could do a great job with Minnesota. But if Minnesota was a three seed and the Kings were the six seed, the votes would go to Mike Brown over, over Chris Finch. I don't know who. 567. Yeah, well, that's the number I'm looking for. It's not the seating. Yeah. It's the number of wins. And 567 is the percentage that Tom Thibodeau <laughs> won coach of the year with the New York Knicks instead of Monty Williams. Mm-hmm. That's the number that I'm watching. Because remember, I mean, I mean, gosh, I guess Monty did it too. Monty ended a playoff drought. Uh, Tom yeah. Thibodeau ended a playoff drought. At this point in sports, thanks to what the Seattle Mariners are doing, this is the playoff drought. If if Mike Brown puts an end to that, well, well, if the Knicks don't make the playoffs, then you do. If Chris Finch did that, what Thibodeau did, he wouldn't have won Coach of the Year. I agree. It was there was a definite. Knicks. Yeah, it's because people are stupid and they vote for stuff in New York. It's well, dumb. Once again, it's dumb. You, you continue to disrespect the Mecca, and I'm going to ask you to stop. 
Matt, you want to host a show with me? <laughs> I was gonna say I'm still here, guys. Like, <laughs> also, like, sorry, audio listeners, this doesn't make sense to you, but for the visualists out there, I don't like KC looking down on me. I'm intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me a question, and I started talking. He stood up. I was like, okay, sorry, KC, you right. probably should start. I'm sorry. <laughs> My back is broken. Like, it's fine right now. Yeah, it's fine. He's looking down on me too, Matt. I think, I think, I, it, it probably is playoffs. I don't know if the number of wins is enough. Um. But I, I, I like that. That was actually a conversation we had yesterday, too, was about Mike Brown winning coach of the year. And we've had some calls this week that got the Kings at 46 <laughs> wins and 60, Hell yeah. 50 wins. And it's like, you know what? Truthfully, as much as this as much as this might wind up on Matt George's low light reel at the end of the year, I'd rather be optimistic now and wrong than like just suck and be right. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, we've done that enough. Right. Like, let's just right. be, we know the product. Like, our eyes aren't deceiving us. The product we're seeing on the floor is better. Preseason or whatever you want to call it. Like, the product we're seeing is better. On Wednesday, when those losses start meaning something and those wins start meaning something, is the product just as good? And that's that will obviously tell the story. I think Wednesday is going to be a great night. Not just oh, right. I think so wins, too, but I think it's going, to be, wins are going to be there. It's going to pop off. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Have you been listening to the Yin Yang Twins Essentials to get ready? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's not very long. It's probably, it's probably about 16 minutes long. I saw I saw Deuce saying something about doing the whisper song, performing the whisper yeah, song. Yeah, I strongly <laughs> advise against that. Strongly strong. If you can seek out the edited version, go for it. But uh there's damn near no such thing. That's true. Even the edited version is like, goodness gracious, man. So we all know performing at King's halftime is up there with performing at the Super Bowl, and Super Bowl yep. is notorious for bringing out special surprise guests. So who did the Yin Yang twins bring out as their suppre- special surprise guest? Because I know 50 is gonna be sad. It's the only oh. one that makes sense. It's Lil John. Lil John. <laughs> it's, it's the only one that works. Perfect. Because man. Because little because you bring out little John as a special guest, now you can do get low. Yeah, yeah, it works. And and Vivek has a relationship with little John. Little, little John, John will absolutely be yeah. at the Golden One Center at some point during this basketball over the next forty-one games, or we're down to forty over the next forty <laughs> games. Little John will be here. The Sugar Hill Gang will be here live. <laughs> oh, Someone they are podcasts for them. Yeah, that's right. They were here last year. They were too short. Will be here. He'll oh, blow the whistle. <laughs> Vanilla Ice. <laughs> Vanilla Ice will in fact be here. Yes, it's 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 Shaq Lupe and Fiasco was great. Bring Lupe Fiasco back. I love Lupe. That was real. Yeah, yeah. like actually I it, love well, Lupe. I you gotta do an outdoor Friday night joint with yep. 50. Well, that's not gonna happen until March at best. Why don't the Kings ever do anything with like Jingle Ball? Because don't they when Jingle Ball comes to town, they do like the it's not called Jingle Ball. What is it called? Jingle Ball is the old thing that 107.9 used to do. But I think that's what it's called. Jingle is it ball. called Jingle Ball? Whatever. Yeah. Regardless, I they should do something with that. I don't know. Someone walked. It's, it's down the hallway. Somebody <laughs> go ask them. Like, I don't know. They're, they're here. But uh, that's, I, I don't know. Yeah. Let's oh. get on that. Come on, Vivek. Uncle V, get, get the Kings <laughs> on TV and do something with Jingle Ball. Yeah, I'm looking forward to D'Lo and KC speaking at halftime at a Kings game. Sorry, KC and, and Guy sp- and getting escorted <laughs> off by security. KC and plus one. Yeah. Yeah, KC and plus one. It was crazy, Matt, we, at that game, Sac State. They gave him the microphone to do the introduction, and it didn't start working until I put it in front of KC. I was like, I was like, I don't think the mic works. And she goes, oh, just start talking. I said, okay, hey, I'm Damian Barling, D'Lo and KC on ESPN 1320. My man KC, I put the mic in front of him and it worked. Yeah, and I almost called him North Carolina instead of North yeah. Colorado. Yeah, it got a little, <laughs> it got a little dicey. The guys in the booth were like, "Why is KC's assistant touching the microphone?" Yeah. <laughs> like, what is? Do we need to get security down there? Is Once again, I wasn't in the same place as Damian was for almost half the game. Let's just let the record state that. Yeah, you were in the press box. Or president box, sorry. He was thank you. He was being no, shown around. No, I didn't get a private tour of, of, of the facility. Y'all don't realize this. We gotta sign off. When the show ends, I get thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> I just get told to leave in case he gets to stay here. They've got fruit for him over in the kitchen and replenishment gator. All the snacks that you see Kenny walk in, that's from the Kenny snack area that they've designated only for him. Um oh, Great stuff, Matt. I really enjoyed the podcast with you and Frankie and Chris. That's that's fun because if we don't poke fun at ourselves, 
this is a cold world. <laughs> this is a cold, cold world if we can't laugh at the things uh, we're wrong about. So we're looking forward to another King season. Uh, make sure you check out Locked On Kings podcast. Man, Matt, the next time we talk, a game will have been played. Yeah, oh, man. yeah. Day after oh, opening night, baby. Man, let's and The queen go, will be flowing. Baby. Let's go. I'm with that. Check out uh, the Locked On Kings podcast. Of course, Matt's fantastic work over at ABC 10 as well. You can check out the D-Lo and Casey podcast wherever you get podcasts.